blog. We're so glad you were able to join us today. My name is Jennifer Kraft, and I'm a partner in our employee benefits group in the Chicago office. I'm also the vice chair of the Cypress Women's Network Affinity Group, and it's my great honor to welcome you all here today. I'm joined by the fearless leader of our global Cypress Women's Network, Ellen McLaughlin, who has been instrumental in supporting and advancing women at the firm for a long time. And under Ellen's leadership, we've been privileged to land on Working Mother Magazine's Best Law Firms for Women list for more than 10 years in a row now, so thanks to Ellen. And when we were planning this event, Ellen and I were talking to Corey Carew, our Chief Inclusion and Diversity Officer. And in light of the, the pandemic, we really wanted to do something special. And Corey said, have I got an idea for you? And, and she was able to connect us with Paula Boggs, who graciously agreed to join us today to, to speak with our attorneys and staff firm-wide, along with our clients and other friends in celebration of Women's History Month. So Women's History Month in general is meant to highlight the contributions of women to events in history and contemporary society, and also to celebrate achievement of women. And our guest, Paula, has contributed and achieved a lot. Um, Paula may be best known in legal communities for serving as the Executive Vice President, General Counsel, and Secretary Law and Corporate Affairs at Starbucks Corporation for 10 years during a time of incredible growth. But she's also had a fascinating career path, including military service, law firm partnerships, in-house and public service roles. She's received numerous accolades, including the Secretary of Defense Meritorious Service Award and Presidential Service Badge for her work on the Iran-Contra Legal Task Force. She's twice earned the U.S. Department of Justice Special Achievement Award for her work as an Assistant U.S. Attorney. She's received the American Bar Association Spirit of Excellence Award and their Notable Member Award. And President Obama appointed her to the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities. And she's a, a musician with a song of the year and gets to vote on the grant. So we are thrilled to have her with us here today. Now, Ellen and I will be playing the Oprah role as we talk with Paula, but one of the silver linings of going virtual is we have the use of the chat function. So please feel free to submit your questions as we go through and we'll include as many of them as, as we can. Also, for those of you who may be interested in CLE credit, we'll be announcing the CLE code later on in the program. Without further ado, welcome Paula Boggs. Hi, Jennifer. It's 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 so great to be with the two of you and with the hundreds of other people I understand are around around the uh, on the call this morning. So let's get started. That sounds great. That sounds great. Thanks, Paula. So you've had a fascinating journey so far, and we could probably spend the hour today just talking through any one of the items on your resume, but we'll let, we'd love to at least hit on some of the highlights as we go through. So I understand you went to John Hop Johns Hopkins University and that you attended law school at Berkeley, where you were apparently a classmate of our partner, Nick Genicopoulos. Uh, so yes. World. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Shout out to Nick. <laughs> <laughs> And then you also served as an officer in the U.S. Army and were one of the first women to receive Army Airborne Wings and a congressional appointment to the U.S. Naval Academy. Wow. <laughs> so can, can you tell us, maybe start with, how did you come to work in the White House? You know, that was uh, quite the circuitous path. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I like telling the story, Jennifer, mostly because it, it is one of failure uh, and, and a road out of failure that mm. led me to the White House. And, and what do I mean by that? So, as you had mentioned, um, I, I, had, um, I had been, I had turned down the Naval Academy. I went to Hopkins on a four-year Army ROTC scholarship. And and then uh, for three years, I was in law school uh, at Berkeley on what is called an educational delay. Now, what that meant was I was only delaying the inevitable, which was I had to pay the army back four years. And so um, I knew that. I joke, you know, unlike 
you know, 90, 90, probably 99% of my classmates, I knew exactly what I was going to be doing <laughs> the day I graduated from law school on day one. Uh, but that wasn't really true. So I, I got into this honors program. I went to the Pentagon. I thought I was hot stuff. And then I failed the California bar. And then um, I really tried to short circuit it a bit, didn't take the professional responsibility test, failed the DC bar. So I have failed the bar twice. I'm in this honors program uh, that I am, you know, on the verge of being kicked out of because I have, I have, I have failed the bar twice and it's a dark place for me, really, really dark. And I'm, I'm really trying to figure out how I'm going to actually even stay in the Pentagon because I, I suspect they're going to, you know, ship me to Fort Bragg or something, <laughs> uh, you know, at any moment. Uh, but what I tell young people all the time, despite this, this huge mushroom cloud that was hanging over me, I, I had to continue to show up every day mm -hmm. and try to do yeah. my best. And that's what I was trying to do. And so on that journey, I got to work with one of the political appointees in the Department of the Army, the Deputy Undersecretary of the Army, a woman, Ami Hover, one of the few women. I mean, there were there were there were very few uh, women yeah. political appointees in uh, in the Reagan administration in the Pentagon, but she was one of them. Uh, and so I had worked worked with her um, on actually a constitutional law matter. It, it was a supremacy clause matter. She was, it, we won, the, the army won. She was impressed. Uh, and so I, I thought I had my shot. So I saw her one evening go into the ladies room and um, I chased her, I, I, I stalked her. <laughs> And I said, this is, this is my shot. And so I was in the Army General Counsel's office at the time. That's where I thought I was about to be kicked out of. Uh, but um, Ami Hover, my client, was, um, was responsible for a lot of stuff, including treaties, any treaties that uh, affected the Department of the Army she was involved in. So I said, wow, you know, I was international studies. I think I can thread this needle and talk, maybe talk myself into a job that doesn't exist, right? Um, to work for her. And so that was my shot in the ladies room. And I just started talking, you know, <laughs> selling myself. Uh, and she didn't buy it right away, but within a week or so, she had brought me onto her team as her special assistant. And, and so, you know, I got to do all this exotic treaty work uh, for a year, but then she left and I was out of a job uh, again. Uh, and so a sequence of events led to uh, one of the women who had worked with me in the Army General Counsel's office uh, she reached out to me and said, you know, Paula, I know you have about 18 months left in your military commitment. They're forming an Iran-Contra legal task force here. Uh, and I'd like to recommend you for it if you're interested. And I couldn't believe it, Jennifer. Yeah. I, you know, I said, how could I not be right. interested, right? So within a relatively short period of time, I was at the White House, I was interviewing for the job. I mean, because everything was in crisis mode then, and I got the job. And, and, and so then another really beautiful thing happened because my status was, I was gonna be detailed from the Pentagon to the White House. I was a military officer um, and, the, the Pentagon was going to say yes, but because the Pentagon never says no to the White House, but I still had boxes to check, right? People to bless this arrangement. 
And so um, one of them was this guy named um, Richard uh, Armitage, who later became the Deputy Secretary of State. But at the time, he was um, an Assistant Secretary in the Pentagon. And I, and I went to him for a blessing, really, uh, to go to the White House. And, you know, he said, this is an amazing opportunity if it's not a trap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to some people and and figure out how legit this thing is and um and i'm gonna get back to you so he did whatever he did he came back to me he said paula i think this is going to be an amazing opportunity and you know i was i was off to the races so i would not have been in the, in in the white house and had that once in a lifetime opportunity without a woman lifting me up at a time when I was in a very dark place. Um, and, um, you know, a white guy in power blessing me and, and, and looking out for me to make sure, you know, this thing that I thought was a shiny red apple was really a shiny red apple. That's amazing. And, and what a, it's, an interesting time in history to be a part of and an and amazing opp opportunity. Um, and then from, from there, am I right that you went to the assistant U.S. attorney role in, in Washington? How did that transition happen? Yeah, well, it, that never would have happened had I not worked on Iran-Contra because that's not where my head was at all. Uh, when I when I joined the White House, it was it, one of the reasons they were interested in me was because of the work I had done with AMI. I had done a lot of treaty work. I had done a lot of international law, right? right. Uh, and it was a raw contra, so there was a lot of, you know, there yeah. were a lot of domestic consequences, but there was also a lot of international law. Uh, so right. criminal law was the last thing on my mind, but of course, Iran Contra implicated a tremendous amount of criminal law. Uh, and my boss at, at the White House, who became a lifelong mentor, uh, Bill Linton, was a former federal prosecutor. And so one day he, um, he sat me down. I mean, literally, he sat me down and he said, what are you gonna do when you grow up? What are you gonna do when you you complete your military commitment. And I said, well, I don't know, but I'm moving to Seattle, okay? <laughs> and the reason I was so resolute about Seattle was because while in law school, I had done a road trip with a friend and become 100% smitten with Seattle. So that was my North Star. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. I don't know what that's going to look like, but I'm going to be in this is Seattle. Where, right? uh, and so, Bill, here we are in Washington, D.C., in the White House. And Seattle is like saying I'm going to be in Seattle is particularly back then before Seattle was, quote, cool. Um, it was like <laughs> you're going to Mars. You're in the White House. You've got this plum job and you want to go to Mars. I mean, that was sort of the, uh, <laughs> you know, the reaction. Yeah. Um, I was getting, but but Bill stuck with me, and you know he said, you know he sold it. He you know he said you should be a federal prosecutor. He said you know you're an outstanding you know investigator. You have mm -hmm. you know you know wonderful investigative instincts, and and you know all of that. Right? There was just one issue, Jennifer. I had never tried a case. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so he, he sold me, he said, you know, he said, Hey, they have, you know, they, they have prosecutors at federal prosecutors in Seattle. Right. And then he did something, um, for me that really set the stage for everything else that, that followed in my career, because he not just mentored me, he sponsored and championed me. Bill reached out to the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle, and he persuaded them to do something they had never done, which was to hire 
a young lawyer who had never tried a case to become an assistant U.S. attorney. Uh, and, and that's what happened. And so for the first time in the history of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle, they, they, they hired a true rookie uh, and they trained me. They made me um, a trial lawyer. I became a trial lawyer because they, they believed Bill. It's not so much they believed me, <laughs> but they, they believed Bill. Uh, and, and, and because of that, that happened for me. That's amazing. And I, you're very modest, but, but I feel like everything you do, then you just knock it out of the park. So, so you go and do this and then you, you earn this U S department of justice, special achievement award twice. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about like what your experience was like there. Were there certain, was, were those the results of specific cases or was that kind of a just general overall contribution to the, the office? Well, well, you know, bef before I I get to that, um, because you know you're a law firm, so there there are like too many vi vignettes <laughs> within this that I think will really strike this audience. Okay, so Perfect. so the first is this. Obviously, it was not a guarantee I was going to get a job with the U.S. Attorney's Office in Seattle, but I was moving to Seattle. So in that process, I was interviewing with law firms in Seattle and in Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, there are two um, really, I think, <laughs> relevant stories to the moment we're celebrating <laughs> Women's History Month uh, about that. Uh, the first, the first is this. So I'm interviewing with one of the largest law firms at the time in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a, I'm a, you know, 28 year old army officer about to leave the army. Okay. <laughs> and I'm interviewing for an associate's position, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm with this partner. And we're, he's asking me some, you know, some of the, the year is 1987. Okay. He's asking me, you know, perfunctory questions that you would expect in a law firm interview. And then he says, are you married? And I look at him hmm. as if he just asked, are you from Mars, right? <laughs> I'm sure. Did you um, just ask? You know, that? you know, and and I look at him. He looks at me, and then he says, he says, "Are you a nun?" That was the second thing that, and and then I really looked like looked at him like he was from Mars, uh, and and I said, "What?" I'm an yeah. associate. Okay, I'm interviewing for the job. And I said, what? what? And he says, <laughs> your your ring. Okay. So now at the time I, I wore my class ring, you know, my Johns Hopkins ring. And it had turned so that I guess it looked like a wedding band. Oh. I guess. Mm. Uh, but it was the most out of the park inappropriate question i i've ever been asked in an interview in my career uh, and it 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 imprinted me that exchange imprinted me i never forgot it and at the end of the day that firm made me an offer i told yeah. them i told them no i never yeah. told them why no, but that had a profound effect uh, on me and, and everything else that, and it was only temporarily, it was only a few minutes of exchange at the end of the day. And it was an exchange that happened over 30 years ago, but it marked me. And so I, I wanted to, I wanted to share that story because you know, no matter how successful 
we are, there are these moments that can mark us, right? Uh, and that was one of those. The second is a great law firm story uh, because I got a conditional offer initially from the US Attorney's Office because of budget reasons. So they said, okay, if we have the budget to bring you on at the beginning of the next fiscal year, you've got the job, but we don't know that. So it was this very gray thing. There was a firm uh, in, in Seattle, which at the time was called Preston Thorgrimson, uh, that made me an offer and said, if you tell us that we are the firm in the event the U.S. Attorney's Office thing, we understand that's your first choice. But if if we're your first choice in law firms, we will hold our offer open Hi. Uh, and, okay. until you know. Well, Jennifer, that ended up them holding that offer open for nine months. Wow. It was the most amazing thing. Uh, and so I did join the U.S. Attorney's Office, uh, but I stayed in touch with Preston and they became Preston Gates. Uh, and seven years later, I joined that firm. Yeah. So, you know, the moral of that story is relationships matter. Uh, in terms of the of the honors I got, they had to do with both in both cases, they had to do with um, cases that had international implications. Got it. Got it. Got it. No, I think you're you're right. It's those those little moments that happen to you that don't may not seem significant at the time that stay with you a lot and 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 kind of I think that's a great example of, of taking the, the long game of relationships and, and, you know, it ended up working out for Preston. They got you eventually for, for a, a period of time. So those, those are very, very helpful stories. And I, I know we're going to talk a little bit about your, your stints at Dell and, and Starbucks as we get in, into the discussion later, but I, I did want to talk a little bit about the band because, Wow, that's totally cool. Yes. <laughs> um, I'd love to know like how you got into music and, and is that always been something a part of your life and, and kind of how it how it developed into the band. Yeah, it takes it takes a very little prompting for me to talk about music. <laughs> <laughs> music music is my is my passion. Uh, I started with music as a little kid. And, and, you know, I had parents who wanted their kids to, you know, play piano and I started with piano. I didn't like piano, but I eventually got to guitar by the, by the age of 10 and I was wholly absorbed by wow. that, oh, wow. that instrument and within a short period of learning how to play guitar, I started writing music. Uh, and so really when, it, when I, when I re-encounter friends I knew in, in elementary school and, and high school, they have very strong memories of me and my guitar, right? Uh, and, you know, and so that, that, it was a big part of my persona until it wasn't. Like yeah. a lot of people who have, you know, some passion in their childhood, you know, the the press of of life overtakes that passion um, sometimes, and it that certainly was the case for me. And so, you know, as I was doing stuff like, you know, being in the Pentagon, being in the White House, becoming an assistant U.S. attorney like and whatnot, that. you know, the more I did stuff like that the less music I was doing, uh, so much so that by my early 30s, my mindset was music was something I used to do. And I know there are people on this call for whom that must resonate. 
you know, that thing you used to do as a kid that you were so passionate about, it's something you used to do, right? And I thought that was my story, but uh, it wasn't, my story wasn't fully formed. My story was still being written, but 15 years really <laughs> elapsed uh, pretty much with that being my story. Music was something I used to do. Uh, and then a tragedy struck uh, me and my family. My, uh, my sister-in-law, my youngest brother's wife, died in a, a car, this wow. just horrible car accident. And uh, my, my niece, who uh, my spouse and I are raising, have been raising for the past um, eight years, uh, was in that car as a two-year-old. Oh my God! Um, and so it was. It was one of those life-shifting moments for me. And at the urging of my spouse, I picked up my guitar again as a way to grieve. Mm -hmm. Now, when the time at the time of the accident, I was general counsel of Starbucks, uh, so I had a very you know intense job and yeah. uh, and music was sort of trickling back into my life. But here's the thing about Starbucks. I, I, I don't know if this would have happened for me any other place. Uh, Starbucks is a place that attracts creative people. A lot of, a lot of creative people find a home at Starbucks. And that is from you know, the barista all the way up to the CEO, right? And and the board, you know, just a lot of creative people. And so as this love of music was reawakening in me, I, I was in an environment, a culture where everyone was kind of rooting for me. You know, the people who worked for me were rooting for me. My peers were rooting for me. My boss was rooting for me. Uh, and so, you know, I had an ecosystem that wanted me to take those steps in music, to, to find myself again there. And, and so when I left Starbucks in 2012, nine years ago, um, it was it was a celebration because you know because people so wanted that for me right and i had a sense a, a a very profound sense of completion at starbucks after being there a decade uh and leaving and, and the reason it was a celebration was people knew i wasn't leaving starbucks I was, I was leaving loss. I was like, you know, I was yeah. leaving this gig that I had been doing and I was going to be doing a whole new gig. Right. You know? Yeah. And so, yeah. and so it was, it was in that spirit. I, you know, I left Starbucks and I, I'm so grateful to Starbucks because, because of Starbucks, I, I get to do what I, what I currently do which is awesome. And like I said, I could seriously keep going down, down this, like there's so many questions from that, but I will let Ellen have a turn too. I won't monopolize the thing. I'll turn it over to Ellen. To ask Hi Ellen. <laughs> Hello Paula. And thanks Jen. So I get to ask a couple of Starbucks questions, which of course, you know, Starbucks is loved by many and uh, we're not back in the office in Chicago yet, but Starbucks was my first stop before I took the the two elevator banks up to my floor. Uh, so we got one kind of question in about, so uh, while you're at Starbucks, because everybody wants to know the answer here, is all the coffee free? Are all the fancy drinks free? Uh, so before we get to the serious <laughs> questions, can you let us know the inside info on that, Paula? Well, I will tell you, I will tell you this, Alan, coffee flows freely at Starbucks. So no one uh, has any problem finding coffee uh, 
at at Starbucks headquarters, it you know every floor has you know a coffee station, and everybody you know I knew, it, me included, you know knew how you know to make it right, you know, and so you know French presses are all over the place, and you know no one ever has a problem finding a, a French press or finding you know whole bean coffee or ground okay. coffee at Starbucks. <laughs> I and yes, it is much, free. But had to add. It is it is free. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can pay for, you can pay for the fancy drinks and and whatnot, but if you're looking for brewed coffee, you you never have to pay it's for everywhere. brewed coffee. Right. Uh, I at figured Starbucks as much. working there. So you had shared with us when Jen and I were talking to you uh, before uh, today how you built your team at Starbucks, which I found to be fascinating in terms of creating the culture that you wanted in your legal department and um, interviewing people and the questions that you asked. So can you talk a little bit about that? I'm, I'm happy to. You know, one of, the, one of the incredible gifts I received from from Starbucks was the opportunity to build a global team and within that a, a, a culture that continues to live today, you know, two general councils later, uh, the, the culture uh, I, I helped lead and form is still there. And that is a culture that that celebrates uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and 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 the plus is important is is from a subject matter standpoint um, one of the most excellent legal departments across Fortune 500, uh, the Fortune 500 landscape. And so, how did how did how was I able to do that? First of all, one of the ingredients had absolutely nothing to do with me, which is Starbucks was on a growth tear for much of the 10 years I was there. Now, the recession was also in that period, but by the time I left, Starbucks was back on the hockey stick. It continues to be on you know, that upward trend. So for, for, I would say seven of the 10 years, it was just growth, growth, growth. Okay, so um, so that had nothing to do with, with me, um, you know, except as a support function for that, right? Uh, but, um, and, and a second thing actually had nothing to do with me, which is the brand of Starbucks is a great magnet for talent, right? You know, it is people want to work for a place like Starbucks. So I had those two things going for me right out of the gate. Uh, but I did want to create um, a, a place where people could come to work and be their best selves, which which to me means being their most authentic self, right? Uh, and at the end of the day, that's what DEI means uh, to me, right? And so to do that required a couple things because the word diversity uh, too often in my view carries too much baggage, okay? And people, people will quickly, too quickly, in my view, go to a place of it's either for those people or, you know, what is this diversity? What does this have to do with me? Um, it's about somebody else. And I wanted to just nip that dynamic in the bud. So one of the ways I did that was over the 10 year period, I interviewed every candidate finalist for a job at Starbucks Law and Corporate Affairs. And I don't mean every lawyer. I mean every candidate, wow. file clerk on up. Uh, and I don't mean just Seattle. I mean Shanghai, mm -hmm. London, 
New York. So people will say, well, how, how did you do that? And why did you do that? Um, I did it um, very selfishly because I was trying to uh, create a culture and lead it. Um, I was able to do it because I made an assumption about the person when I met them and I only asked the same questions of every candidate because I was looking for the same thing, fit. So the thing, the assumption I made was my team would not waste my time. So anybody I was meeting could do the job. That, that was an assumption. I, I came very quickly to a place of trust with my team that they would not waste my time. And so I didn't have to figure out whether the person could do the job. I just had to, in the short time I had with them, figure out if they were a fit. And I could do that by asking one, why are you in my office or why am I talking to you <laughs> and see what they say. Uh, second, um, what do you need in a job to be fulfilled? Whether it's this job or any job, you know, what does that look like for you? And the third was, a third was, you know, what drives you nuts in a job? And then the fourth was the final uh, question was, what is your diversity story? So right out of the blocks, I was asking somebody, no, but no matter what they look like, no matter what their gender was, no matter, you know, what their story was, I was asking them that the leader of the organization was asking this person to share their diversity story, you know, which means everyone has one. And, and, you know, and if you don't think you have one, you better make one up, right? <laughs> you, better come up, you know, you better come up with a diversity story because the general counsel is asking you, right? And, and so that's what happened by the, by the, by the end of the decade I was there, I had personally hired, you know, three quarters of the department, if not more. And so those people every single one of them had been asked that question what is your diversity story and so by definition it couldn't be about somebody else right it was about you right too i mean it's fascinating number one that you would take the time as a very busy general counsel to interview everybody from the top down uh, and to ask those probing questions um, I know you've talked about sort of the recipe for success and, and that your uh, job should be your soul. Um, I mean, how do you, I'm, I'm a little bit off questions, but for you, how do you, how do you know whether what you're doing at the time, and you've talked about your transition to music and how that happened, um, how, do, how do you or others uh, that are listening, how do we make sure that for career-wise or for your life, we've got a recipe for success here. What, what should we be asking ourselves? Is it goal setting? It's like how, because you've had such an accomplished career, but you can tell you've loved every second of it, uh, except maybe the dark moment at the beginning. <laughs> um, so so how, how have you gone about doing that? Yes, well, you know, there's, there's, an, an interesting law firm story that is embedded in all of that. So if, if I go back uh, 25 years, I, I, was, I was a partner at what was then Preston Gates and Ellis. Uh, my, my then partner, now spouse, uh, was the art director for news for MSNBC. So on the surface, we both had these sort of, you know, highfalutin jobs uh, that a lot of people would say, wow, that's really cool, you know, partner in a big law firm, you know, art director for news for this, you know, amazing startup at the time, MSNBC. But we were both miserable. We were both absolutely miserable. And I had a 
uh, my what turned out to be my last trial in private practice. I didn't know that at the time, but it was just this horrid case where, you know, and I, and I say this lovingly, we stupidly uh, took this case on contingency and were representing the underdog in this fight with this Goliath. It was a classic David and Goliath case where we were representing the David and we were in the Goliath's hometown and it was sheer hell every mm -hmm. single day. day. I mean, it really, really was um, just a slog, eight week trial. And, um, and at the end of it, miraculously, we won. Uh, we, we won, but it was for me, Ellen, and, you know, I was, I was in my mid thirties at, at the time and uh, early thirties. And I said, you know, it doesn't get any better than this. You know, you win, you're the underdog, you win this eight week trial, you know, the jury says they loved you and I can't do this for the next yeah. 30 years. I, I know I can't do this. So one, um, it was at the beginning, this, this case had been at the end of, of a year. And so my, my spouse and I were at the, at the kitchen table uh, and she just asked me the question, you know, she said, are you happy? And I said, no, I'm not. And, you know, it, and then she said, well, what would happy look like? I mean, what, what would, you know, not, not a particular job per se, but what would be the ingredients in that job uh, for you? And I said, I need, I need to be part of a team. I need to, I need to be, I need to be in a mission driven organization. You know, I, I recalled how I felt when I was an army officer or a, a federal prosecutor. And it wasn't so much that I needed to be working for the government, but I, I needed to be in a mission driven organization where, you know, there was a North star and most people were, you know, rowing <laughs> towards right. it or something. Um, and I, you know, and I needed to be in an environment where I could be entrepreneurial where I could, you know, kind of do my thing, right? Uh, and um, and I, I, and one of the great things about the firm that I loved was, you know, I needed to be surrounded by smart people. I, you know, I get energy from, you know, being around smart people, and um, and there's all, you know, there are many flavors of smart, but um but that gives me energy when i'm around other people who are just like doing it right? right uh and so i you know i was like i need i need those things and it i don't even know if it needs to be in a particular place but i need those things and she went through a, a similar list uh, and so the upshot of that was we had clarity around what those ingredients needed to be. We didn't know what that was, right. but I will tell you within six months of that conversation, we were leaving Seattle, moving to Austin, and I was starting at Dell Computer Corporation. <laughs> so, so how often do you do that? Is it when you start to feel, oh, I'm not really happy in a particular role. Is it something that you do on a yearly basis? So is it very um, systematized uh, or is it more based on kind of how you're feeling and whether the particular position that you're in uh, really is uh, part of your soul or whether it's you know, not so much I need to reevaluate? Yes, that's a great question. And, you know, for me on my life journey, it is, has been a mix of that, right? Um, when 
I made the de- when I made the decision to leave Starbucks, it was it was very much in the 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 mold of okay, I'm not going to leave now because one of the things that separate apart from music, I wanted to someday in my life work on a presidential campaign, volunteer for a presidential campaign. And for me personally, Barack Obama was that person. I did not think another person in my lifetime was going to inspire the emotion I had for that candidate uh, and uh, that individual in my lifetime. So in, in 08, I made the decision to stay at Starbucks because Starbucks was a recession and that was not how I wanted to leave Starbucks. But it also triggered sort of a, a new chapter for me personally in my relationship with Starbucks uh, because it was, it, it's not now, but um, Obama's gonna be running again in four years, right? Yeah. So what what should that look like, even without music, what should that look like for me and, and Starbucks? And that was a conversation just between my spouse and me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, a public thing, but um, we plan, we were very planful, my spouse and me, about how I was going to message to my boss, I was leaving Starbucks. We role played. We, <laughs> it was, you know, and because it was really important to me, as it has always been important to me, to stick the dismount. You know, if you're right. a gymnast, it doesn't matter how many flips and fancy things you're doing, if you flub the dismount, that's all anyone remembers, right? And I did not want to flub my dismount from from Starbucks. So that that took time. It it, it took making sure I felt wh- whether Starbucks felt this way was beyond my control. I could only control what I felt and what I did. And I got people in my department ready. I had when mm-hmm. I left, there were two people I believed could do my job. And one of them got my job, right? Um, and um, and so there were things like that that you know weren't going to happen overnight, but over a four year period, very much could happen and should happen. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and so yes, it was very planful that way. Um, you know, being in a um, financially secure position to take that leap out of a perfectly well-functioning plane, um, you know, that was an important ingredient for me and my family. Yeah. So, yes. Okay. So you've talked a lot about the progression of your career and I, I appreciated uh, your defining moment with the turned around uh, ring. I had one of those when I was a second year uh, law student interviewing for a job and I was engaged at the time and the partner I was interviewing with, not at Cypher, uh, said to me, oh, I see you're engaged. So are you really gonna practice law or once you graduate, are you just gonna stay home and have babies? And I gave him the Oprah, what? Right, from the Meghan Markle interview. I love that, what? Uh, But of course, this was decades ago and I'm like, same thing. I didn't take the job offer, but I'm like, holy cow. Yes. So hopefully we have come a long way from those two defining moments. But as you've progressed through your career, have you seen, uh, and I hope the answer is yes, uh, uh, the perception of women, right, in the workplace uh, uh, progress, change, and get to a much better place than when we were uh, you know, decades ago. Yes, I I have been uh, quite warmed by the the opportunities so many young women have today 
uh, that, you know, my generation, you know, either didn't have or was trying to create. Uh, and, you know, a, a perfect example of that, which, you know, has, has, a, has a great ending. Uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins, it had only recently opened its doors to women. In fact, I was oh, I was in the fifth class of women who went from freshman year all the way through. So women were very new. There was no women's running program at at Johns Hopkins until I helped co-create it. And there was an athletic center. This is a true story. And entering the athletic center, if you were entering this athletic center, you were handed a jock strap. <laughs> it, it, it didn't matter that we didn't need them. Uh, you, you know, you you enter this man's athletic center, you get this man's jock strap, right? And so, actually, last week I was telling the the, the women's cross country team uh, at Johns Hopkins the story, and they're national champions and all this great stuff, and they thought I was making it up. And that's the beauty of yeah. the journey. Uh, from my generation to this current generation. They thought I was making it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. That's a, a very good visual. Uh, yes. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it back to Jen, but I always like to yeah. take little nuggets, and there's plenty of them uh, from our conversation today. But I want to tell everybody who's listening to do not do not underestimate the power of conversation in the ladies' room, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like that, but that a lot of that happens at our workplace. Uh, so don't forget about that. Uh, all of you women who are listening in, the ladies' room is often the place to be. Uh, thanks, Paula. Jen, uh, back yeah. to you. Thank you. We can and we've had a lot of questions come in um, over chat, so I, I thought I could run some of those by you. One was, as, as a general counsel, were there any pet peeves you had when working with outside counsel or, or young lawyers? Things that we could learn from from there. Oh, yes. Um, there, there, there are a few. When I, when, when I first joined Starbucks, as you might imagine, you know, there was a, there was a general counsel who came before me who had, you know, relationships with certain firms and, and this and that, which was, which was fine. And like most new people, I was not, you know, hot to trot uh, to, you know, change things, you know, overnight. So I inherited um, a, you know, a suite of law firms that were, you know, supporting uh, the, you know, the work of Starbucks. Well, you know, most of them, most of the firms, you know, within really within days, if not hours, we're, we're trying to get, you know, on my, on my calendar <laughs> and, you know, and get, you know, for us to get to know each other and, and whatnot, which was great. There was one firm that will go unnamed where the, the labor and employment team was very consistent with that pattern. They were, you know, they were, uh, they, they reached out. I, you know, we were going to have a meeting. Everything was great. Their corporate securities team, radio silence, nothing. Mm. Weeks go by, months, nothing. And so I, <laughs> I call in the, the, the head labor an employment uh, partner for this firm. And I said, I love you. I like you. You do great work. Your colleagues in corporate securities, I've heard nothing from yeah. them. So here's the deal. I can't control what you do internally in your firm, but I'm only going to deal with you. So, so, you know, I don't, I can't control what your firm calls you 
but you're my relationship partner, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, um, and he became the relationship <laughs> partner. Uh, and that's how, you know, that, you know, that played out. So, you know, to this day, you know, and I, I you know, I don't know what happened with those guys, whether they just presumed that they were getting, they were going to continue to get the mm -hmm. business and they didn't have to work for it. But that was a false assumption. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's a good example of the value of relationships. That really is Im important. Um, thank you. A another question we got out, you know, we've heard got in a, a number of um, people have talked about women experiencing ex imposter syndrome where you, you feel like, you know, you're not you're not worthy uh, to all of all of these things. And, and what are your suggestions for how tips for how people can deal with with that type of imposter syndrome thought? Yes, and I, you know, I, I had the, the good fortune of, of having a major case of imposter syndrome when I was in high school, there was something that happened. And again, at the beginning of my career, uh, because of failing the bar, you know, so, you know, when, when I, when I failed the bar, I had, I was overcome by this sense of, wow, I, you know, I, I guess I've been gaming the system up to this point, but, you know, the chickens have come to roost, right? And you go through this thing, what, what I have learned with time is every every experience and every opportunity has purpose i mean i just i i just had this conversation with my mom who is 84 years old and when she was in her 30s went through the most horrible divorce with my dad okay but yeah. she in the conversation we just had said that was really important that was it because had that not happened there are many things in her life that would not have happened um had that not happened and and so the a similar thing is true with imposter syndrome you you are in that moment because you're supposed to be in that moment and yeah. you you know and it it, it's important for you to keep telling yourself that, right? You know, it, you you are there because you are supposed to be there, and 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 hopefully that's the kryptonite for for imposter syndrome. I love that. That's, that's very helpful. Um, wh what strategies or tips do you have for women to? better support other women and also specifically women of color um, to improve our numbers in in the legal profession and how do we advocate for ourselves and and advocate for others to kind of build people up thoughts on on that yeah i do and it even though your question is about women lawyers uh, the example i'm going to give is is not necessarily restricted uh, to that. And, and the bottom line is, I feel this deeply as a woman, whether, whether it's as a woman or as a person of color, or, I mean, you know, but the, you know, or as, you know, you know, a member of the LGBTQ community, I am often, even today, 2021, in situations where I'm the only one, okay? And if you, you know, to, to, to shamelessly paraphrase, you know, Hamilton, you know, <laughs> if you're in the room where it matters, you've got to matter in that room, okay? You, you can't just be in the room where it matters. You've got to matter in the room, okay? And you know, one of the examples <laughs> I think I shared uh, with with you, Jen, was being in the room with the CEO and the CEO's direct reports uh, at a time of of you know darkness, recession, where the 
the, the culture was, you know, we've got to cut the fat out of this organization and people are lazy and, you know, they're not doing what there's, you know, we need to get rid of those people. There's a cancer afoot, you know, in the organization. That, that was the mindset of people coupled with people trying to impress the CEO who was also the founder. And so in that environment, you know, I was, I think, one of two women uh, in the room. So the room is, you know, the room of the CEO and, and his direct reports. And so there's a lot of chest beating and, and testosterone flying around um, <laughs> trying to impress the CEO. And so one of these guys says, oh, you know, the laziness of some of these people. You know, I just saw a woman sleeping on a couch on the eighth floor. Okay. It, you know, and it, you know, the, the presumption is that's laziness, you know, we're, and we're trying to cut out laziness. So, you know, I'm sitting across, the CEO is at the head of the table. This guy is, is next to the CEO and I'm across the table. So I look at the guy, not the CEO, I look at him and I say, you know nothing about this woman. You don't know if she's been up for the past 48 hours trying to meet a deadline. You don't know if she's going through chemotherapy. You don't know if she's been up with a sick child. You don't know. Right. And I and I just and I just I just would not leave um, my gaze just bore into him. <laughs> uh, and so there's this moment and the CEO just says, okay, let's move on, right? But I had made my point, right? And no one ever again made a comment anywhere close to that afterwards because they didn't know. But right. had I not been in the room, that would have been the presumption and they would have run with it. Well, you have certainly mattered in the rooms that you've been in, <laughs> Paula. So real quick, we're at time. I want to read the CLE code. It's SS is in Cypher Shaw 3844. Again, the CLE code is SS is in Cypher Shaw 3844. And for those who can stay on another moment, um, I would just like to wrap up. I, I find that one of the uh, benefits as I've moved into middle age is that one of the upsides is the wisdom that, that you gain. And and so I would love to tap into some of your wisdom. Um, do you have any thoughts on what advice you'd give to your younger self or words to live by or a favorite quote that you would like to share with us? Well, I'm going to share a favorite quote. And this is, this is something that, um, my 14 year old friend wrote in my yearbook freshman year <laughs> uh, when I too was 14 years old. Uh, and, you know, the setting was Germany. Uh, and we were kids uh, attending, you know, school, American schools in Germany. Uh, and the year was 1974. And that is really important uh, when you hear the quote because this, my friend, she was Irish Catholic. Uh, she was kind of preppy, um, kind of square. But in my yearbook, she wrote, every time I look at you, I know why black is beautiful. Mm. And I must say, Jen, the rest of my life, I've had that in the back of my mind to be, to be right. worthy of that statement, right? To be worthy of it. And I guess the bottom line is for your audience, you never know where wisdom <laughs> will, will come from. And, and for me personally, the most profound of it came when I was 14 years old. That is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, Paula, and, and all your words of wisdom. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. 
Um, we wish you all a very happy Women's History Month and a great week weekend. Thanks all. Thanks, Thanks for having everybody. me. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.